Okay, a divine warning by the prophet for the nations. The citizens of all free national governments, according to the national constitution, are all of one family bearing one free national name. Those who fail to recognize the free national name of their constitutional government are classified as undesirables and are subject to all inferior names and abuses and mistreatments that the citizens care to bestow upon them. And it is a sin for any group of people to violate the national constitutional laws of a free national government and cling to the names and the principles that delude to slavery. I, the prophet, was prepared by great God Allah to warn my people to repent from their sinful ways and go back to their state of mind of their forefathers. Divine and national principles, they will be law abiders and receive their divine rights as citizens according to the free national constitution that was prepared for all, all free national beings. They are to claim their own free national name and religion. There is but one issue for them to be recognized by this government and the earth, and it is come it comes only through the connection of the Moorish divine national movement, which is incorporated in this government and recognized. You know. Uh, recognized by all nations, other nations of the world. And though if, if they and their children can receive their divine rights, unmolested by other citizens, that they can cast a free national ballot at the polls under the free national constitution of the state's government. <clears throat> state's government and not under a granted privilege as has been the existing condition for many generations. Uh, you who doubt whether just real quick, brother. Uh, does anybody else hear static, or is it just me? Yeah, I hear some static. Okay, I think I'm not sure what you hooked up to, but uh, okay, let me see. Can you hear me now? I can hear you, but it's a little, it's a little static. Uh, let me just let me. All right, go ahead. Try try a couple more paragraphs. If uh, if it still happens, I'll just I'll relieve you. I'll just take over. Okay. You who doubt whether I, the prophet, and my principles are right for the redemption of my people, go to those that know law in the city hall among the officials in your government and ask them under an intelligent tone, and they will be glad to render you a fair a favorable reply, for they are glad to see me bring you out of darkness into light. All right, let me let me take over something. Something I'm not sure what it is, but it's kind of staticky. Uh, okay. So money doesn't make the man. It is free national standards and power that makes a man a nation. The wealth of all national governments, gold and silver, and commerce belong to the citizens alone. And without your national citizenship by name and principles, you have no true wealth. And I am hereby calling on all true citizens that stand for a national free government and enforcement of the Constitution to help me in my great missionary work because I need all support from all true American citizens of the United States of America. Help me to save my people who have fallen from the constitutional laws of government. I am depending on your support to get them back to the constitutional fold again, that they will learn to love instead of hate, and, I, <clears throat> and will live according to love, truth, peace, freedom, and justice, supporting our free national constitution of the United States of America. I love my people. And I desire their unity and mine back to their own national and divine standard because day by day they have been violating the national and constitutional laws of their government by claiming names and principles that are unconstitutional. If the Italians, Greeks, English, Chinese, Japanese, Turks, and Arabians are forced to proclaim their free national name and religion before the constitutional government of the United States of America, it is no more than right that the law should be enforced upon all other American citizens alike. In all other governments, when a man is born and raised there and acts for his national descent name, and if he fails to give it, he is misused, imprisoned, or exiled. Any group of people that fail to answer up to the constitutional standards of law by name and principles, because to be a citizen of any government, you must claim your national descent name, because they place their trust upon issues and names formed by their forefathers. The word Negro, the in Latin, language to the word nigger, the same as the word color deludes to anything that is painted, varnished, and dyed, 
and every nation must bear a national descent name for their forefathers, because honor and I, thy fathers and thy mothers, your days will be lengthened upon this earth. These names have never been recognized by any true American citizen of this day. Through your free national name, you are known and recognized by all nations of the earth that are recognized by said national government in which they live. The 14th and 15th Amendment brought the North and South in unit placing the Southerners, who were at the time without power, with the constitutional body of power. And at that time, 1865, the free national constitutional law that was enforced in 1774 declared all men equal and free. And if all men are declared by the free national constitution to be free and equal, since that constitution has never been changed, there is no need for the application of the 14th and 15th Amendment for the salvation of our people and citizens. So there isn't but one supreme issue for my people to use to redeem that which was lost. And that is through the above statements. Then the lion and the lamb can lie down together in yonder hills. And neither will be harmed because love, truth, peace, freedom, and justice will be reigning in this land. In those days, the United States will be one of the greatest civilized and prosperous governments of the world. But if the above principles are not carried out by the citizens of my people in this government, the worst is yet to come because the great God of the universe is not pleased with the works that are being performed in North America by my people. And this great sin must be removed from the land to save it from enormous earthquakes, diseases, etc., and I, the prophet, do hereby believe that this administration of the government being more wisely prepared by more genius citizens that believe in their free national government and laws through the help of such classes of citizens, I, the prophet, truly believe that my people will find the true and divine way of their forefathers and learn to stop serving carnal customs and merely ideas of man that have never done them any good, but have always harmed them. I've always harmed them. So, I, the prophet, am hereby calling out aloud with a divine plea to all true American citizens to help me to remove this great sin which has been committed and is being practiced by my people in the United States of America because they know it is not the true and divine way. And without understanding, they have fallen from the true light into utter darkness of sin. And there is not a nation on earth today that will recognize them socially religiously, politically, or economically in their present condition of their endeavorment in which they themselves try to force upon a civilized world. They will now refrain from their sinful ways of action and their deeds have brought Jim Crowism, segregation, and everything that brings harm to human beings on earth. And they fought the Southerner for all these great misuses. But I have traveled in the South and examined conditions there. And it is the works of my people continuously practicing the things that bring dishonor, disgrace, and disrespect to any nation that lives a life. And I am hereby calling on all true American citizens for moral support and finance to help me in my great missionary work to bring my people out of darkness into the marvelous light from the prophet Islam. Um, I want to say peace and love to Brother Benjamin Bay, Brother Shalom. Coleman, peace and love. Peace and love. Peace and love, Morris. Peace and love. Let's see here. So I let Brother Benjamin Bay, you got this astrology piece we left off on medical astrology. Medical astrology is more science. We're on uh, chapter two. Let me know if I need to make it bigger or if it's cool. Oh, no, I can uh, zoom in on it. Okay. Uh, chapter two. <clears throat> the signs, the crosses, the houses, diagnosis. The signs. The signs help pinpoint what part of the body is potentially suspect of dysfunction. Of course, not all signs, but the planets within them will respect malfunction, will represent malfunction. In medical astrology, the most important planets are the outer ones, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. Mars also needs to be carefully examined. Although the sun, <clears throat> moon, and Mercury, Venus, and Jupiter should never be discarded, a higher percentage of medical alignments stem from the action of the five other planets when they are in hard aspect. 
particularly if they are two or more in conjunct to a specific planet. You got areas, uh, bones, cranium, and face, muscles, the frontals, occipitals, oc I guess you're like your eyes. Uh, uh, oc you. you say? Ocicles? It's occipital. Occipitals is on. Uh, Atolins, uh, depriments, uh, articulum, uh, zygomaticus, uh, temporalis, and buccinator. Buccinator. Arteries. Buccinator? It sounds like a U sound, like buccinator. 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 Uh, artery, the temporal and the internal carter cauteroids. Uh, veins, the cephalic vein, cell salt, cali, phosphorate, phosphoreceum. Uh, areas well as the head in general, specifically the motor centers of the brain and the circulation of the blood through the skull region. The action of areas is said to show epilepsy and sleeping sickness, encephalitis. Uh, that that may affect the brain through virus. Areas is also involved with the inflammation of the brain that may cause delirium, frenzy, vertigo, dizziness, and sharp pains in the head along the course of a nerve and congestion. Those people with the planets in Aries may suffer from frequent headaches caused by clogged or sluggish kidneys, Libra, that have a flex action to the head, digestive, disturb digestive disturbances, cancer, resulting in headaches and sluggish gallbladders, Capricorn. Other cardinal crosses, diseases, and various skin eruptions affecting the or face, as well as baldness plague some Aries people. Other diseases influenced by Aries are various forms of toxic toxema. By a reflex action to the kidneys, toxema may induce skin alignments, usually caused by poor diet. A uh, uremic uh, toxima is also a possibility in pregnant women. A more subtle and insidious form of toxema can also invade the blood and cause havoc in many ways. The sun in Aries. This placement might result in unusual amount of blood congestion causing headaches, brain fever, cerebral meningitis, uh, sunstrokes, or... Heat strokes, ap apocalypse, or the inability to express oneself properly through speech patterns or loss of verbal comprehension. Uh, there is also the possibility of an imbalance of the sodium potassium exchange. With too much sodium causing weight gain and eating enema, there, there is a further probability of acidosis because Aries people tend to eat a lot of meat high in acid, thus the alkaline exchange may be out of balance, especially if Libra is involved. Acidosis can also be in headaches. All right, so just real uh, quick, just, I, just a little summary before you move on of uh, what, we, what we're dealing with here. So it, it appears, based on what you read so far, that, well, I don't know if everybody knows, but Aries is dealing with the head. And, you know, people that have different, that have airy placements, we see the potential um, the dis-ease that they can go through based on their astrological chart. So once again, this is called medical astrology. And we're, it's imperative that people get the chart done uh, to, to see what's in their chart, to see why they might, potential problems they may have, different tweaks in their diet that they may need to do tailor-made for the individual. So there's a couple of new people on here that this book is a new new to, so I wanted to give give a uh, quick synopsis. Uh, but, you, but, you, but you got it, you got it, brother. All right. Uh, moon in Aries. Moon in Aries can mean weak sight and eye strain since cancer ruled by the moon governs the sac containing the eyeball. Migraine headaches are also possible because the emotional strain and tension can, and there can be insomnia from lack of potassium moon in the body. Mercury in Aries. 
Headaches caused by nervous tension or strain may also result in this configuration. Brain disorders are also possible because of lack of proper nerve uh, sense synapse. A release muscle co coordination because yes, coordination problems or speech thinking impediments cause could occur as a result. In addition, neurologia or shooting pains in the head may come about. And paralysia, paralysis is what the fuck? sets in as well as spells that sounds like I got mercury in areas. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, uh, Venus and Aries. Well, just to kind of the root word would be like paralyzed. So that's, you know, um, para, para paralysis. 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 Is, you know, oh, so this, this is your. You can identify with this. Um, you got Mercury and Aries. You got Mercury and Aries, uh, Brother Benjamin? No, my Mercury is in Pisces. Oh, okay, okay. Probably one. Speaker like that. Sounds like I'm underwater all the time. Uh, Venus and Aries. Venus and Aries may affect mucus congestion in the head and nasal passages. There can also be eczema of the head and face as well as a gastric headache from overeating carbohydrates or other rich foods. Mars and Aries, this placement may produce violent pains in the head, rupture of the blood vessels in the brain, stroke, extreme rest restlessness, blows, cuts, and wounds, or surgery of the head and face. So, Cerebral congestion and tendencies towards headaches. Jupiter and Aries. Excess blood in the head causing stress on the vessels may result from Jupiter and Aries. The, pl uh, the placement also presents the potential for an aneurysm. 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 If the veins and or and or arteries do not remain flexible or elastic. Saturn in Aries. With this placement, constriction or lack of blood to the head may cause strokes or mucus buildup in the ears, resulting in earaches and deafness. Saturn in Aries can also signify apathy, listen, listlessness, or dullness because of lack of blood supply to the brain. Uranus in Aries. Uranus in Aries may sharp shooting pains in the head. Sudden headache, pains in the eyes, or spasmic contractions, constrictions of the blood vessels of the eyes by the reflex action to le Libra spasms of the kidneys may result in subclinical albarin. Yeah. Let's see. Did show you how to get that one? Albuminuria. Albuminuria. As well. Neptune in areas. This placement may mean weakened adrenal gland, ad, ad, adrenal gland functions build up in the head area in general, causing mental fatigue, allergies involving the sinus cavities, and weakened kidney function by reflex action to Libra. The blood vessels in the brain may be weak and unable to take high blood pressure, such as a stroke may result. Pluto, Pluto in Aries. Since Aries rules the general site of the head where the pituitary gland is located, and since Aries is ruled by Mars, when which in turn rules the adrenal glands, there can be also there be there can be a possible malfunction of the pituitary hormones that direct the adrenal secretions depending on Pluto's aspects to other planets. The adrenal glands may be sluggish, hypo or hyperactive aneurysms heard in the head, all in the head area, all are also a possibility. So we see Mars. we're seeing all these head issues, right? With specificity. So that's why once again I can't stress enough getting a chart done. 
so man can know thyself. <clears throat> it's imperative. All right. So I, I would imagine you want to do some some throat action right now. Dealing with Taurus. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, Taurus, Bones. Uh, cervical vertebrae, muscles, uh, stern, sternohoid, uh, mastoid, trapezoid, uh, sternomastoids, esophagus, stylopharyngeus, splenius and complexus, longus, uh, scalenius, bibentrius, cervix, and cervix, uh, arteries, external cortoids, and balistor artery, basilia artery, uh, veins, uh, the occipitals. These ones, uh, she said that before too. It seemed like a button with the words that she said, like, do, 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 do. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, <laughs> uh, jugular and veins of thyroid gland, uh, cell salt, natural, natrum, sulfurexium. That that was a great. One. I took a great swing at that one. Uh, so for Rick's come. Shut up. Uh, Taurus rules the adenoids, tonsils, and larynx. Its main function, however, is co rulership with mercury of the thyroid gland. This gland frequently malfunctions because of severe emotional stress and lack of sufficient iodine in the diet or diet that is lacking in fiber and roughage. And, and ruggage, rug hedge. Very often by reflex action to Taurus opposite sign Scorpio, the thyroid may go hyper or hyperactive because the colon time. Some symptoms of a hyperthyroid condition are tint, tinnitus, inability to relax, shaking, heart, palp palpitations, uh, weight decrease. Heat intolerance, excessive sweating, and increased bowel act activity. That sounds like a bad time. Unfortunately, few people are aware that their thyroid are hyperactive and blame their nervous conditions on themselves or something within their immediate environment. The mental anguish a hyperthyroid can cause is great. Some people feel as they are tipped around the boundaries of insanity, getting a T3, T4, T7 blood test to check out the thyroid is easy, quick, and worth a person's mental and physical well-being. Hypothyroid systems are obesity, dry skin, lackluster, and brittle hair, low blood pressure, slow pulse, sluggish of funk of all functions, and depressed muscular activity. People with hypothyroid feel mental and dull and listing. Uh, very dying. Don't be a hater. One second, one second, maybe more than one second. Uh, displaying poor memories in general, these are sensitive to cold droughts and continually overdressed to keep warm. Constipation also tends to be a problem. The, con the conjugal form of hypothyroid hypothyroidism is called criticism. Why y'all can do say that? In Canada, all babies are given mandatory blood tests to take Make, to take to make sure they don't have the disease. Excuse uh, sun and air, sun and Taurus. This placement may produce sore throats, nasal mucus, polyps in the throat region, right? Um, or the vocal cords and dysthermia. Moon and Taurus. The moon and Taurus can mean sore throat as well as swelling in the throat or ulcers. A person with this configuration in a natal chart is also likely to overheat because of emotional unhappiness. Mercury in Taurus. Horses, coarseness from nervousness or talking at length. Croup, croup. A difficulty in swallowing at all times, choking on objects, and a lagger. Large genitus are all potential alignments with Mercury in Taurus. She's staying. In. Uh, Venus in Taurus. This configuration can indicate swelling in the neck, 
mumps, stress, or fungus infection of the mouth or throat and abscess in the forex region. Um, Mars and Taurus. Mars and Taurus may create a hypothyroid condition, uh, a lar largenitis, enlarged tonsils, tonsillitis, um, pop polyps in the throat area, ad adenoid problems, and inflammation of nasal passages. Uh, Jupiter and Taurus. Enlarged anenoids or tonsils, dry coughing, spills, sore throats, and enlarged thyroid or possibilities with displacement. People with Jupiter and Taurus are also tend to overeat and desire too many rich foods that put on weight. Sun and Saturn and Taurus. Saturn and Taurus looks great. Now, this placement may cause a phlegm in the throat, a dry cough, loss of voice, choking, suffocation, and, and hypo of the of the thyroid gland. Hey, that's crazy, yeah. man. Just real, real quick, because I got Taurus placements, and sometimes I'll be like, <clears throat> I'm always clearing my throat. <laughs> <laughs> that's not funny, man. No matter how much tea I drink, no matter how good I'm eating, I'm always got that. <clears throat> it's like a love, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I'm like, sun and tar or Thanks. sun and in my head, like the like right now. I don't have a headache, but the left side of my head sometimes like hurts. So mm -hmm. I, I get with it. So like some like a nerve. So I always have to stay hydrated. Like I'm always drinking something, so I don't like cool my head off. That's a, that's interesting. How you can't you can't shake nature like it's. <laughs> yeah. You shake it. All right, you got it. You got it, man. Uh, urine and Taurus. Spasm in the thyroid gland, causing it to go from normal to either hyper or hyperactive. May result from urine and Taurus. Stress, especially any sudden and unexpected shock to the system, may cause the thyroid to malfunction. Colon status, yeah, statistics can all can also contribute to the problem. This placement may produce a sudden loss of voice or hoarseness attributed to bull to nervous, nervousness, and there is a potential danger of choking or gagging on objects. Neptune and Taurus. The thyroid may malfunction with the placement, especially during stress. There may be lethargy or loss of memory with a hypothyroid or a nervousness and heart pounding with a hypothyroid by the reflex action in Scorpio. Neptune and Taurus can also mean a weak or slow peristalsis system of a large intestine. The result can be toxema. And as the, as the poisons filter back into the bloodstream, symptoms such as headaches and skin rashes may appear. If the toxema persists, if the toxema persists, the entire cardiovascular system may be affected. Uh, glaucoma and uh, cataracts may also result if the person has a family history such as alignments. Illness. Illness. Or, shout out to more. Illness. Pluto and Taurus. With Pluto and Taurus, there is a possibility of the thyroid complications of a severe and chronic nature, as well as polyps, tumor, tumors, or growth, or growth, growth on the vocal cords, thyroid, or within the neck region. Wow. Well, we can stop right here. Uh, everybody in the chat, whoever, on any level, let's have a discussion on what was read in this first segment dealing with astrology. Any thoughts? Anything people can relate to? Anything in general before we go to the next Segment. Okay, so just a recap. So Aries deals with the head, and then Taurus deals with like the cervicals, like the neck area. So anyone that has any of those placements, such as the Aries or a Taurus, you should look out for those areas and learn how to treat it. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, and like like for another example, like Pisces is dealing with the feet, so. I'm pretty sure once we read the Pisces section, we're going to be dealing with different foot problems or, uh, uh, you know, what 
just knowing that so you can know how to circumvent it and uh, have a good experience. You know, but yeah, that was, a, that was an excellent, excellent summary, I would say, basically. Appreciate your patience with my reading. <laughs> oh, yeah, we here for you, man. Please. Appreciate that. Anybody else got any thoughts on the, on this segment? I mean, I know why, but this book for sure should definitely be in a hospital, but they may be using it, but it's like self-healing should definitely be self-evident or it shouldn't be any hospitals in this book right here. Like, as long as you know your chart, it's like no excuse. You know what I mean, like, this is, you know, woogie woogie, like everybody has a humorous radius, whatever that word, is, you know, like human anatomy or more science than like level 20,000 right here. Yeah, like, it's like above and below. I, yeah. I, I, yeah, 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 yeah. Sick dude. Any any other thoughts on this this peaceful transition? Uh, I just wanted to say I I, think I was just like so and just thought it was I think it's like real interesting because. I've never uh, gone into like details too much or, or seen like the the detailed study of like um, health flow with like, you know, when we were born with our zodiacs and stuff like that. So just good information to just collect and soak in. That was just my, my take on the world. Oh, yes. Yeah, awesome, man. Mm -hmm. All right. All right, so let's go to the next. <clears throat> the next. So we're continuing from a book called Moorish, Moorish Paradigm, book four. <clears throat> by Brother King Bay. Let's just start reading. Um, I know the Brother D.L. was, I think a couple weeks ago we had stopped right here. So I'm, I'm going to pick it up from where we left off at. Uh. <laughs> So one of my college professors tried to say that Egyptians were dark-skinned, quote-unquote, Caucasians. A Rasta sister and I let him have it. I said to him that Heroditus, who you Europeans refer to as the father of history, said, quote, it is undoubtedly a fact that Cochians are of Egyptian descent. My own idea on the subject was based on the fact that they have black skins, quote unquote, and woolly hair. Not that amounts to much as other nations have the same. And secondly, and more especially on the fact that the Cochians, the Egyptians, and the Ethiopians are the only races which from ancient times have practiced circumcision. Circumcision. And I go back to the, you know, how to refer to more as Jews. But, you know, Jewish people practice circumcision. So here's a quote from Heroditus. Well, that was a quote. I just read Heroditus, the histories, uh, Penguin Books, page 167. Now, even if you try to say that Egyptians were dark-skinned Caucasians, because it was a, just to give a little background, it was a, a uh, professor that was trying to teach in the school that these were quote unquote white people that were just uh, dark or whatnot. So now, even if you tried to say that Egyptians were dark skinned Caucasians, did those same dark skinned Caucasians also have woolly hair as well? That would be the argument. The next day, the professor apologized and preface his reading of that text that day by saying the Egyptians are quote unquote uh, dark skinned Caucasians while looking at us. <laughs> Below are some more quotes regarding the so called Hamatites, Kushites, Ethiopians, and Shemites. The key unifiers of the vast empire reestablished by Nimrod was the Canaanite Phoenicians. Now keep in mind for the new people. Or this is new. We kind of went over this a couple of weeks ago to an extent, but Nimrod was responsible for unification 
of the Moors after the flood of Noah. And our people were loosely referred to as Cushites, dealing with Cush, Hamatites, dealing with the father Ham, um, Canaanite, Phoenicians, which were all names of that, that the foreigners would call our people. Phoenician, we created phonetics and language. Uh, these are all Moors. The key unifiers of this vast empire reestablished by Nimrod was the Canaanite Phoenicians. They unified the various lands, which were fragments of the Atlantean, Atlantean Empire. So we talk, talk about Atlantis. Once again, you got fragments of right Atlanta, Atlantic Ocean. So there's there's signs and uh, landmarks left over that shows that America was Atlantis. Just want to throw that out there. The way they did this, the way they did it was through their mastery of seafaring and navigation. So we traveled the world and we spread the culture. That's why it's pyramids in America, pyramids in Russia, pyramids in China, South America, etc. So the seafaring is how we traveled the planet, expanded the culture and unified the culture. So this picture right here above is a picture of a Canaanite noble. So, you, get, you know, you embrace this picture, become one with this picture. You see, like, you go to LA for, in our case, I seen a brother look like this walking down Western in Vermont, Crenshaw somewhere, right? But <laughs> when we knew what was going on, Canaanite noble, all right? It is obvious that he has the phenotype of what today will be considered a so-called African. These great mariners are the ancient Canaanite Phoenician ancestors of us modern-day Moors. And here's a quote by Elliot Smith. It was a lecture in 1915 where he quotes a great many of the most distinctive practices of Egyptian civilization suddenly appeared in more distant parts of the coastlines of Africa, Europe, and Asia, and also in course of time in Oceania and America. And, and to suggest that the Phoenicians must have been the chief agents in initiating the wholesale distribution of this culture abroad. So this is cross-referencing to reinforce that the Moors were seafarers. And based on that seafaring being nomadic, not only spread the culture, but doubled back and united the culture in different areas. That's how we had an you know, empire. It was pretty much the whole world. The Moroccan empire was the whole world, basically. Uh, split up into Barbary side and a Tartary, Tartary side. But nonetheless, Moroccan Empire was the whole world. Thus, after the flood, our ancestors set back out across the world to reunite and re-civilize the scattered fragments of ancient civilization, the Mu and Atlantis. We spread all over the world, and I would like to now take you on a little tour of our people scattered all over the world so that we can take note of the things that unite us. And that we all have, and what we all have in common. Let us take a cursory glance of the ancient empire of Mu and Atlantis. Let's begin where we stand, or dealing with America. Our ancestors have been here for a long, long time. Since the days of glorious Atlantis, we've been right here, up and down the old man Mississippi. And that made me think about Noble Joe, I leave that statement he made about how we up and down the Mississippi as well. Denoting that we've been here the whole time. To the right, this picture right here is a picture of a Mohawk chief. First off, it is plain to see that he is what we will call it more. Beyond that, take a good look at the mace he holds in his hand. It is exactly the same 
as that scene in this picture on the wall in Albany, <clears throat> Albany, West Africa. On the, on the next page, we'll look at that. Remember the extent of our dominion in Mexico. And here's a quote from the Circle 7 Holy Quran, the violently prepared by Noble Jew Ali. It's a quote. Their dominion and inhabitation extended from Northwest to Southwest Africa across the great Atlantis, even into the present North, South, and Central America, and also Mexico. And the Atlantis Islands before the great earthquake, which caused the great Atlantic Ocean. So that's why that's in the Quran. He's giving you a history lesson of what we've been talking about. So here's the other picture that was brought up. If we compare this one, this is what the quote unquote Indians and Native Americans looked like. We, we know there was Moors, um, highly melanated. You see the garb. This is not bow and arrow, bones through the nose and tents and teepees. You see we got silks. See how fly the Mohawk chief is looking, right? So compare this to uh, a West African monument. You see this what's in his hand. That's what that's what's being highlighted. And this is an example how of a culture. I like somebody like grandma. <laughs> you feel me? And you see the green and red color scheme, green and red flag. Right. Definitely Moorish. All right, so let's continue. To the right, we have an example of a of Phoenician and Etruscan writing. The Etruscans inhabited Italy before the Romans. So this is a little lightweight. So most people will say just Greek in general, but specifically our people. Etruscan, the Minoans, or will ultimately become later Romans. But these are these are dark-skinned people. Just to give a little, and, and so the original inhabitants of Sicily, the original inhabitants of Italy, are people, highly melanated people. Just want to throw that out there as well. The Etruscans inhabit Italy before the Romans. They were very close to the Canaanites of Carthage, North Africa, from who was descended the famous H Hannibal. So whoever doesn't know about Hannibal, look up Hannibal Bay. In Google, you might just put Hannibal and it's going to tell you what he is responsible for, but he was a great general. Uh, his war tactics were uh, were used and implemented in later military strate strategic strategy. Just to give a little summary on the brother Hannibal. These tablets speak about, now that these pictures are kind of off, so I'm gonna be going up and down. Uh, so we're talking about these tablets right now and the contents of these tablets right here. What, what was being talked about or what is the tablets expressing? <clears throat> So these tablets speak about the goddess Unai. So now we're, talk we're talking about the Etruscans. We're talking about the uh, pre-Greek, or what our people loosely refer to as Greek. What they put on these tablets. These tablets speak about the goddess Unai, or Uni, who was the same as the Canaanite goddess Astarte. The tablets said to have been found by the founder of the Mormons. He was said to be on the go uh, of the Mormons was said to be on the gold sheets. The word Mormon is derived from the phrase more man. Is it a coincidence that the angel who revealed the tablets name was Moroni? And the place where the tablets were found was called Kumora. By the way, the founder, Joseph Smith, was killed in Carthage, Illinois. So Joseph Smith, the founder of the Mormon ideology, said that he discovered these sheets and based on these sheets and the content spawned the Mormon religion. Of course, we know it got watered down, but we know the, the original inception 
You see what it's based on, the Moorish culture. And he was killed in Carthage, Illinois. <laughs> so talking about Carthage, which was a big uh, empire. <clears throat> so right and below, here are two more examples of Phoenicians taken from their own artwork. These are the people who the European scholars used to teach were white people. Believe it or not, some still teach that. I once had a Spanish teacher in college who told a class of predominantly unconscious Moors that the Carthaginians and Phoenicians were white. I challenged this in class, and many of our people were fascinated. I quoted many works and told her I would bring in proof the following day. <laughs> the next day, I brought in a stack of books to prove my point. After I finished with her, she told me that she would be retiring at the, at the end of the year. <laughs> In that she will use the time to re-examine some of her notions of the history. This showed me that the lies previously accepted, unchallenged as true, can only stand as long as we allow it to. All the lies and falsehoods perish, whether under the intense light of the sun, or sun synonymous with the truth, College professors are now becoming more cautious in what they say as a result of the challenges of those Moors who are waking up. And that's imperative today. You know, we got to go in, go into these schools, go into talk to the youth, talk to just, just bring awareness in general. And that's going to level out the playing field of the false information that's continuously being put out there unchallenged. That's the key. It's unchallenged. People just hearing it. Oh, that's how I go. You know, Indians was here. Christopher Columbus discovered it. And they're going to run with that narrative. So above is an Etruscan young man out hunting birds. So let's go to that. This is this the picture that's now we see the man highly melanated. Let me look in the chat. Somebody says something in the chat. Oh, should be back. So, right, highly, the Greeks, highly melanated people. Brother Larry Bay, peace and love, man. Peace and love, peace and love. <clears throat> I quoted many works and told her, okay, I read that already. All right, so above is the Etruscan man hunting birds. I showed y'all that. This is kind of crazy right here. I was to the side, but we're going to get through it. So above is a picture of the Minoan navigators. Notice they all have dark brown skin and short afros. These are the builders of the great Minoan civilization who preceded the Greeks, the original people of the lands of the Greeks and Romans who were the descendants of dark brown skinned hematites and descendants of Japhet. So I know it's to the side, but here's a little afros right here. Hold on, thanks. Hold on. And, and see how the consistent theme is we're navigating. We're always on the water. I mean, sea as well. Right. Yeah. A E I O U term. Mm -hmm. Etymology. Yeah. Same thing with the Vikings as well. Right. Same thing with the Vikings. Consistent theme here. So here's another picture of the same type of tip, the uh, Minoans. Pre people that I refer to as Greek, pretty much that's the whole point. <clears throat> is these were dark people, just not blonde hair, blue eyed people at this time doing these things. That's the whole point for us to comprehend that, so we can express that to our people in an intelligent fashion. Let me check the chat here. 
Uh, probably brother Kabaka Bay. Probably in another forty minutes. We'll be out. Be done. Uh, I got a uh, quick question, brother. If you can help me. Oh yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I know. It, I know it probably has a lot of uh, details that go uh, into it, but I'm in the same. Like I've come across the same thing that like. You know, the original Romans is melanated, uh, Greece, and some, uh, some of these other places that we would think that were just predominantly European, just white in the beginning. Um, far from you coming across the information, and maybe you'll even explain it a little bit in here. How do you think that that transition came from it being um, more melanated representation from that area and then it becoming uh, um, as far as the more pale pale uh, image that we see today. Do you think it was like like a, like a civil war in it or or um, just kind of what information do you got on, on, on that difference of them, you know, being melanated to now looking, you know, less or non-melanated. So when you look up the reconstruction, the great book burnings, um, the papal bulls in their mission, the papal bulls, um, Willie Lynch manual, these things, you, you'll start putting these things together and you'll see it was a it was an agenda to bury this information to the best they could, you know. And um so reconstruction is that just like what the definition says, they reconstructed history and um made the images different, you know. Um mm, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. also brother, if I can chime in for a moment, uh, this is Larry Bay. Uh, you had what was known as amalgamation that took place. Amalgamation is when you had uh, people interracially mixing with one another. So, for example, you know, Northern Africa, um, if you pull up the definition of more, it would tell you that uh, the, the people uh, originated from Mauritania and Morocco. But if you look at Morocco today, the people all fair scan. What happened was when Spain fell, right, this opened the door for the intrusion into our empire, especially on the African continent. So these people started moving south. And you have to remember is that the Slavics, which is another word for slave, is a definition for slave, we enslaved them first. And we brought them into our area, uh, into those regions you know, as slaves at that time. And then they started inter, 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 intermixing and marrying within our own, um, into our own um, um, society. And then you had amalgamation that took place. You started having a fair, a fair each generation of different fair skin of people coming into mix. This is how it all happened. Okay. So I just wanted to chime in and um, bring that, um, uh, an author that's really good is um, Ivan, um, Sir, um, Ivan, uh, I can't say, I, Ivan Van Sertatima. Sertima. Check I'm, out some of his books. What's that? Yeah. Ivan Van Sertima. Yeah, there you go. I'm sorry. I, I botched his name. Yeah. Um, check out some of his books, man. He, 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 he demonstrates how um, this took place and how some of the fairest scam people ended up on the African continent. Mm -hmm. Also, more than masonry shows, you know, our dominance as well, and that'll show how you know we slowly losing power. Right, exactly. That's a good one right That's here, our brother. Brother Dubay. Oh yeah, thanks. They came before Columbus. It's an excellent book. So. Yeah. Um, Appreciate Any other thoughts, questions before we, before we move on here?
statements? All, all gravy. All right. So we have a, a Sumerian deity right here. Uh, loosely referred to as Phoenician. This would be the area today that they call Iran, Iraq. Loosely referred to as Persia. Our people referred to as Persian. But you see they got feathers, Moorish headdresses on. All right. So. <clears throat> but one of the great factors in explanation of the naval supremacy of the Phoenician on the lower seafaring was their acquaintance with the fact of astronomy. So the fact, so let's 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 marinate on that. The Phoenicians were big on astronomy. The Moors were big on astronomy. To even travel the seas, you would need to know about the stars for a sense of direction. Mm -hmm. More science. And right. hieroglyphics too go, to go along with the uh, Phoenicians, you know. Phonetic language bringing down those hieroglyphics to earth to nav for navigation by uh, you. For sure. Wow. Yep. Excellent. Excellent point. They were only able to embark upon their great maritime experience in virtue of the use they made of the polar star, the pole star for steering. So here's a the John Reynolds Library, Ancient Egyptian Civilization. We're dealing with back to the woolly hair, all the, you know, the ancient Buddhist statues and any ancient statues on the planet. They're going to, you're going to see woolly hair, which is denoting hair like lamb's wool in the Bible. For lack of better, lack of better words, right? So above, here's a, here's a picture of Sargon II in the, it's kind of like a little lap, so I'm going to go back up. So this is the picture of Argon II. So people can like put on a Google search or try to research Argon. And then you're going to see what the what the brother Treyel was talking about. He's going to look extremely not like this. To throw you off like if this wasn't our people back then. And that's part of Reconstruction. Um, so Sargon II of Assyria a descendant of the Kushitic line from Nimrod. We're still talking about the Kushites. Same people. Notice the concentric circles of his hair and beard. This was an ancient motif used to symbolize our so-called quote-unquote nappy or tightly coiled and curly hair. Also notice that he is wearing the royal crown of kingship, the fez. You can see the tassel running down the back. Now, once again, I'm going to go back to the picture. There's a tassel coming down the back here. He's like uh, Captain Jack Sparrow. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Captain Jack Sparrow. All right. So let me continue here. You can even see the tassel. Right. So notice his unk. So the, if you look at his earring, you see he got an unk. Now think about, like I say, most... Iranian, Middle Eastern people, this is, they call this, these Sumerian guys, the, the mothers and fathers of civilization for Iran, right? He got the unk on. So you know what the unk means, right? We're dealing with balance, we're dealing with fallopian tube, the ovum, man and woman being in balance. The unk is actually a symbol of the yin and the yang. It's the same expression to an extent, right? As above, so below, masculine, feminine, the balance of masculine and feminine to create order and peace in society. So, so we got a question in the chat, uh, Kabaka Bay, what is the meaning of the fez? So the fez represents the womb, the tassel, the umbilical cord. It's an expression of life coming through the womb. Um, we got the four, you can't probably see it on mine, but there's four circles on the top, dealing with the four gates, the four seasons. Etc. So this is a lightweight summary. All right, so let me uh continue here. All right, so we got the unk earrings. <clears throat> so Morduk, which just means a Moorish duke. On the left, here's a picture of Xerez, the Persian emperor. 
So once again, the Persian community, anybody saying they're Persian, we want to eloquently, sophisticatedly with scholarship show them how they connected as Moors. Because the whole mission is to unite humanity. Notice again, the crisp curl motif of the hair. All of these rulers, including the pharaohs, were all descended of the mighty families of Ham, Cush, Canaanites, etc. and foot. So once again, here's a picture that we were talking about right here. Still got the fez on, Moorish garb, be considered Persian. So below here is a Greek vase showing the same motif, but I'm talking about this picture right here. So this would be the original Greeks, once again. Here is a Greek vase showing the same motif of the curly so-called kinky hair as tight, concentrated, concentric circles. These, This motif was used specifically to dramatize our particular hair and was universally used and recognized as such. The founders of the Minoan civilization, which eventually led to the Greek civilization, look like the person portrayed on the vase. The pictures are kind of lagging. That's why I keep going up. So we'll get to this picture in a minute. Godfrey Higgins in his book, The Apocalyptus, Volume 1, says, quote, all the gods and goddesses of Greek were black. At least this was the case with Jupiter, also expressed through the character Zeus, right? So we're dealing with Greek, Greek mythology, Zeus and Apollo, and all these personifications represent planets. Just like Jesus or Yahshua represents the sun in a certain context even though we know Yahshua ben Yosef was actually a real person. But the way they promoted in the modern Bible, we're dealing with the sun. These are personifications of uh, planets and the energies and characteristics that these planets bestow in our human experience that we're having. Because Hercules, Apollo, Amun, the goddesses Venus, Isis, Hecate, Diana, Juno, Metis, Ceres, Sibello are black. So this was a quote from Joffrey Higgins. There is much controversy, at least amongst your European scholars, to whether or not the original ancient Hebrews or, or Israelites or Hebrews were white or black. Looking at the following cultures should clean up that take. So here more um, highly coiled haired Hebrews or what they refer to as Israelites. All right. Above here we see the motif used in India or Hindustan to represent the hair of Buddha. Everywhere the Buddha's hair is represented, it's as curly or so-called kinky. So let's go up to the pictures because, like I said, we're lagging here. So this is it's talking about these pictures right here. So the ancient Buddha, and we see the, the positioning of the Buddha, right? Yoga posture, meditation posture, uh, back straight, promotion of Activation of the Kudalini. All right. Highly kinky hair. Here's another picture. Similar, similar position. Yeah, like like pretty thick lips too. Especially the one at the top. Right. You can see and the nose like a uh, Lulu and Stitch character. And the and the um the earrings too. You know, and, yeah. and how he got his hair. Like yeah, coiled, hair. coiled or a temple, made like a temple. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, more pictures of the Buddha. 
All right. So, yeah. somebody got something I want to add? Yeah, yeah. I wanted to add for those, uh, for those Muslims that have the title Bay. If you look on the etymology, Bay means a governor in the Turkish district. So, when you, once again, when you're talking to people of Pers that are quote unquote Persian, when you mention that title Bay. They know exactly. You can connect it from from us to them in translation that you know we were all Moors at one time, but they they can definitely relate to the to the title Bay and give you this look like how did you, you know how did you get that that title like you know but they don't have an understanding because of the book burnings that you know we were all connected at one time. So I just wanted to add that in too as well. That's fire. Fire. Anybody else have anything they want to add? <clears throat> All right. So continuing on the, the Buddha pictures that we were looking at. Hmm. This is a quote from Godfrey Higgins in his book, The Apocalypse, Volume 1, where he states, quote, The religion of Buddha of India or Hindustan is very well known to have been very ancient. In the most ancient temples scattered throughout Asia, where his worship is uh, yet continued, he is found jet black with a flat face, thick lips, and curly hair of the Negro. Several statues of him may be met uh, in the museum of the East India Company. So that's I find that interesting that what we're looking at is in a museum in Hindustan or India that's ran by the East India Company. And whoever doesn't know that the British colonized Hindustan, modern day India, Pakistan. And the full name is called the British East India Company, whoever didn't know that. So any part of the planet that tagged our people Indian, just know the British, uh, it's a British tag. Our people uh, in the Americas, the old, the Moors, the old Mac culture, the Moors, the Aztec culture, the Moors with the different Cherokee, whatever, these different tribes of Moors are loosely referred to as Indian as well. Right. So, hey, 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 brother, hey, uh, brother Moffy, can I add in one more thing? Hey, this is Larry Bay. I want to add in one more thing. Um, brother um, Abdullah Bay, he had posted one time. And this resonates with me, man. It stuck with me for, I mean, it's just, it's in there, man. But that he posted that if you proclaim to be an Indian, there are three things that's going to apply to you. One, you're not an American. You are a British national. Number two, you come under, you don't, as an Indian tribe, you don't come under a unit of international law. And number three, an Indian tribe, their sovereignty is only within the state that it exists in. For example, if you it's in New York State, the laws of New York State applies to that Indian tribe, and there's no international protection. So, I I, I um I warn a lot of brothers and sisters to to um be very careful with associating being an Indian. Anyway, I do, I yield the floor. I just wanted to add that in. Right, that's excellent. All right, brother, to Baka, I mean, uh, Kabaka Bay, I'll uh, just, just tap in with me throughout the week. We'll, we'll keep chopping it up. Okay. Any other thoughts before I continue? All right, so even in Thailand, they use the quote-unquote nappy hair motif to symbolize the Buddha. And this is the Thailand piece right here. Second one. All right. So above is a close-up of the ancient Jews, the people of Judah, from Sennacherib's palace wall. Again, notice the hair motif. There can be, there can't be any doubt whether they were white or black. There should not be with the giving of the nappy hair. So. Once again, these pictures are lagging, so the 
the Jews from Judah. That's this picture right here. People that refer to, you know, that they loosely refer refer to our people as Hebrew or Israelite, um, highly dark people. With, with, with the hair and the pheasants. I'm seeing pheasants right here. It's fed right here. Two pheasants. Yeah. No. The God is going up right there. Got a pheasant. Mm -hmm. With the guy behind him. They look like Sumerian guys. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. It, and as the that's what the whole trick with the uh, reconstruction history is they got our people thinking we're different. Yeah. He's a Hebrew. He's an Israelite. He's a the Christian. He's this whole separate people. But that's why it's good to do the genealogy and the, and the, you know, all roads lead back to Kush, Ham, or some type of ancestor of the Moors. All right, so let's continue here. So above is another close up of how the original tribe of Judah looked. So that would be this picture. Curly hair, coiled hair, et cetera. Uh, I think I was gonna stop. I think I was gonna stop here actually. So the wall depictions, which are impressive both in size and artistic skill, are among the few known depictions of what Jews look like in biblical times. They are now located in the British Museum. Right. Uh, we just talked about that. So no wonder it says in the Bible in Amos 9, 7, are ye not as children of the Ethiopians unto me? And in, and in the Geneva, actually, the uh, Geneva Bible, it says more in there, but later it said Ethiopian. O children of Israel, saith the Lord, Last but not least, I close with the picture of the ancient Canaanite god El, who later became Yahweh in the Bible. In the Bible, Yahweh is referred to as El and Elohim, El plural, the seven spirits. And many names such as Michael El, Gabriel, Israel, are merely compounds of El. The Canaanite El is also the source from which derived the Moorish title El. Notice he also has thick lips and nappy beard so that would be once again i have a better picture because this one uh of the hebrew or israelite god uh ken and i got yeah. so i put a hebrew or israelite guy l it comes up here is a you can see get a better picture can y'all see the feds on the brother All right. Yeah, I can see it. <clears throat> so this is how you unite the people once again. You get, you, when you come from this perspective, you can unite anybody on the planet, any ideologies, how we can come together. Any things like if you, if you unite your know, gods, like, like the planets. El and God, like the planets, El is like creator, and the seven spirits, the seven planets are the creators of all things. We're like on the birds of the planets, that's why we're like many gods and many Els. And like, what was that? Like last last Sunday, we was like, we're just uh manifested planets, you know, like it's a bunch of Mercury's in here and Jupiter, so those are like the El, the God. The, the seven spirit, the seven creators. I was like, oh, that makes sense. That's why we're held in Bayes. Because must create, you know, bring that light. Bayes govern. Like, I, you know, it kind of just hit me with a ton of this. I'm like, oh, hell. Yeah. Like Gabriel, the moon, Michael, I'm like, oh, the sun. Oh, wow. Again, the circle seven says seven spirits are the the creators of all things, the reasons for everything. That's the idea. Like, why did that happen? Oh, because the sun is, you know, opposite this planet. You know, hell is opposite this hell. So that God is reflecting that God creating this moment or whatever. But I, you know, that's me. Yeah. 
That's it. That's fire. Fire, man. Yeah. Any any other thoughts on that piece? Where we uh get into the Quran, Circle Seven Quran. So we got the Mormons, right? We can get at the Mormon community and show them <laughs> how, they, yeah. how they come from the Moors. Anybody. That's super funny. I went to, went to a Mormon church uh, back in high school only because uh, they were taking us to play basketball. Mm -hmm. So we had to like read a couple chapters out of the Mormon book and we went to go play uh, basketball in like a carpeted uh, gym. But that was Full circle now. I was like, wow, we were actually like at the morning in school and all that, and reading about that. But I'm, I'm crazy being more in there, not knowing. I just gonna just, I'm just here to hoop. This is what I gotta do. All right, cool. But right, yeah, I yield. Talking about them, that many things about that. I yield. Yeah, I said crazy, man. Um, so we're dealing with chapter forty-two, holy instructions from the prophet dealing with weak weakness. <clears throat> vain and inconstant as thou art O child of perfection how canst thou be weak is not inconstancy connected with frailty so being inconsistent is considered frail or weak right can there be vanity without infirmity avoid the danger of the one, and thou shalt escape the mischiefs of the other. But the importance of consistency, the importance of having foundation to even be consistent in the first place. Wherein art thou most weak? In that wherein thou seemest most strong. So it can have been an illusion that you have strength in that area. And in, in, in that the wherein most thou glorieth, even in possessing the things which thou hast and using the good that is about thee. Are not thy desire and are not thy desires also frail? Or knoweth thou even what it is thou would have wished? When thou hast obtained what most thou sought after behold it content thee not so you've been you just been wishing and praying to get whatever xyz once you get it you're like oh man it's not even as fly as i thought man I'm a, now you're not content with that you were three four years trying to obtain this <laughs> you thought it was gonna bring you the great joy and i'm like i'm burnt out on this man it's not even all right so all that is uh Superficial. Wherefore loseth the pleasure that is before thee its relish? And why appareth that which is yet to come the sweeter? Because thou art wearied with the good of this, because thou knoweth not the evil of that which is not with thee. Know that to be content is to be happy. Couldst thou choose for thyself? Would thy creator lay before thee all that thy heart could ask for? Would happiness then remain with thee? Or would joy always dwell in thy gates? So if you got a bucket list of things that you want in a perfect world, if you had all those things, would you really be happy? Or would it be something else that you would be wishing that you could acquire? At some point, you must be content or be present. All right, we're not thinking too much in the past. We're not thinking about the future too much. In a in a way that you're worried worrying about it. Of course, we want to plot and plan, and of course, to to build or whatnot. But don't get stressed out over your past or the future. Stay present. Yeah. Alas, thy weakness forbiddeth it, thy infirmity declare against it. Variety is to thee in the place of pleasure, but that which permanently delighteth must be permanent. 
right? True happiness is something that you're content with. You, it's permanent. When that is gone, thou repenteth the loss of it. Though while it was with thee, thou despised it. So you might find value in something that you no longer have and be like, man, I should have. I should have been more present with that. I should have appreciated the value of whatever that may be after it was gone. You're thinking like that. But when it was in front of you, took for granted, took it for granted. That which succeedeth in it have no more pleasure to thee. And thou afterwards quarreleth with thyself for preferring it. Behold the only circumstances in which thou or rest not. Is there anything in which thy weakness appeareth more than in desiring things? It is in the possessing and in the using of them. Good things cease to be good in our enjoyment of them. What nature meant pure sweets are sources of bitterness to us. From our delights arise pain. From our joys, sorrow. Be moderate in the enjoyment or have moderation in your enjoyment and it shall remain in thy possession. Let thy joy be founded on reason and to its end, sorrow, like sorrow will be a stranger. Right? So don't abuse things. Moderation. Something happens, good or bad. You're not getting too high. You're not getting too low. You got a got a nice even keel temperament about things. The delights of love are ushered in by sigh, and they terminate in languishment and de and dejection. The objects thou burdeneth for nauseates with satiety. And no sooner hast thou possessed it, but thou art weary of his presence. Join esteem to thy admiration. Unite friendship to love. So shall thou find in the end content so absolute that it surpasseth rapture. Tranquility more worth than ecstasy. So peace is more important than ecstasy. Even though you might find a little ecstasy in the route in the in the road to peace, but it's about the peace. Allah have given thee no good without his admixture of evil. But he have given thee also the means of throwing off the evil from it. So we got the power of discernment. We have a conscience. As joy is not without its alloy of pain, so neither is sorrow without its portion of pleasure. Joy and grief, though unalike, or united. Our own choice only can give them to us entirely. So to go through pain when you finally do go through joy, you can enjoy it that much better. You have something to compare to. Melancholy itself often giveth delight and the extremity of joys are mingled with tears. The best things in the hands of a fool may be turned to his destruction. And out of the worst, the wise will find means of good. That's that's 17, 17, the cold line. So blended is weakness in thy nature, O man, that thou hast not strength either to be good nor to be evil entirely. Rejoice that thou canst not excel in evil and let the good that is within thy reach content thee. The virtues are allotted to various stations, 
seek not after impossibilities, nor grieve that thou canst not possess them all. Wouldst thou at once have the liberality of the rich and the contentment of the poor? Shall the wife of thy bosom be despised because she showeth not the virtues of the widow? Number 20 code too, so somebody that doesn't have that much nine times out of ten they they would be more content than somebody that has a lot because the person that doesn't the person that has a lot if they were ever in the position of the poor they would be going crazy probably kill themselves all type of well that's an extreme but we see examples of rich people that uh get a taste of poverty they're going crazy versus a poor person that will have more content so if a poor person ever did get to a, um, work their way to a level of that stature, they would be more inclined to appreciate the present time because they can reflect on the time when they were poor versus somebody that doesn't have no concept of what poor is. Um, to give an example, that's, that's how I digest that. If thy father sink before thee in the division of thy country, can I once thy justice destroy him and thy duty save his life? If thou behold thy brother in the agonies of slow death, is not mercy to put a period to his life? And is it also death to be his murderer? Truth is but one. Thy doubts are thine own raising. So the truth is one. Doubts are individual based. He who made virtues, what are? He who made virtues, what they are, planted in thee a knowledge of their preeminence. Act as thy soul dictates to thee, and the end shall always be right. intuition you know you can see people vibe you know feel people energy typically that's a a compass that uh is not wrong too many times uh, any thoughts on this chapter holy instruction on weakness <clears throat> They remind me of a uh, sun being in Capricorn right now, where the sun that is weakest. So it correlates with, you know, your vitality being weak. I think we spoke about that before, but with Capricorn being a restriction, this is talking about, you know, strengthening up your weaknesses. Sometimes you got to cut off something to strengthen it up. So that reminds me of this. You know, it's very Saturnian, you know. Because Saturn makes us strong, but we need that martial energy to, to do it. But Saturn creates the situation to right. build us up. So, yeah. That would show me about it. Yeah. Oh, I gotta use a I gotta use a I'll be right back. All right, Islam. Islam Moors, Islam. Hey, I just Islam. wanted to, Islam, this is Larry Bay. I wanted to, uh, man, has, any, has anyone ever heard of the J Treaty? No, I haven't heard of the J Treaty. Yeah, the J Treaty. It's still in effect to this day. The J Treaty, uh, it allows Moors to navigate back and forth from Canada unimpeded. Because when Canada and the United States was establishing its boundaries between one another. There was the distinction that the people there were quote unquote Native Americans were Moors. And we had the ability to go back and forth between the two unimpeded. But in today's time, of course, obviously they're going to ask you for some kind of travel document or passport or something. But I just wanted to bring that up. I actually read that treaty. I was just wondering if anyone else ever came across it as well. 
the like the Jade or the J like Treaty. J J J A Y. J A Y J Treaty. This treaty was written back, I want to say, around the beginning of the 20th century, around 1905, 1904, something like that. Many of the treaties that involve us, we got to jump into the time machine got to jump into the time machine obviously there's no treaties involving us in today's contemporary times but in the older days those older times those treaties were all set up man benefiting us and that they're still and actually they're still in effect it's just our lack of knowledge you know what i'm saying yeah yeah man j treaty oh, i don't know this is what i'm checking out it was between uh, the Treaty of Amity and Commerce between the Brit Britannic Majesty and the United States of America. Well, the United States and Great Britain. Yep. Is that yep. treaty? Yeah. That's what they uh, Discovery and Conquest, right? It is. You got permission to do this. You got permission to do this via the British Crown, telling the British uh, colonies what they can do on our land or land that they found or beat us up on. Yeah, yeah, that's so pretty much. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> um, did you want to kind of share, Larry Bay, your? Now, I still want to do, I'm going to do, we're going to do a live later today if you feel free, but if you want to just do a, um, how everything went down with the with the Orange County Sheriff and. Yeah, 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 no doubt. Um, I'm going to be very brief in my explaining. Um, so I was traveling and I was stopped by Orange County Deputy Sheriff, uh, Sheriff, and he pulled me over. And at the time I had my uh, feds, I was wearing my feds. So he asked me for license insurance and registration. I told him I had a national ID card. Then he asked me, was I Moorish American? I replied, yes. And then he ordered me out of the car and he handcuffed me. So to make a long story short, you know, I told myself to, to, to remain, you know, to remain calm, keep my poise, you know, even though they were attempting to gaslight me. So to make a long story short, they ended up pulling up a old driver's license that I have from like 2014, and then they try to write a bunch of trumped up charges and stuff based on that driver's license. And I snapped my fingers because what I did after nationalizing, everything that was in the public, I started canceling all those contracts, period. You know, but the driver's license, although it expired, I didn't surrender it. So that was the first thing that I had to do as soon as I got home. I surrendered that driver's license, although it was 10 years ago. I surrendered it. But anyway, fast forwarding, I called the Westminster um, uh, Traffic Division Court, and I asked, "Was my name on the um, on the calendar for February 22nd?" They said no. Then they gave me a number to call the DA. I called the DA office, and they told me, "No, your name is not on the calendar. No bother showing up. No need to come into court. All charges are dropped. Don't even come in." So then I said, well, what about my private property that was um, seized from me after the Fourth Amendment warrant? He was like, well, you need to call the sheriff's department. So I called the sheriff's department, you know, after a little running around and leg pulling. They finally came up off of my, my national ID card. So when I went down in there to get it, the sheriff, they, it was two sheriffs standing in there. And they asked me, they asked me, they said, um, where's your driver's license? And I said, man, I don't have that, man. I don't have any of that crap. I don't, I don't possess any of that. That stuff is, I don't even know what that means, sir. And I'm here to, uh, I'm here to pick up my private personal property. In fact, it's not even my property. It's trust property. It belongs to the trust. I said, you guys are in violation. And then um, after, you know, he made a phone call upstairs. And I guess whoever made that he called to, they were like, look, 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 just give him his ID. Let them keep moving. Don't even bother. Just don't even don't even deal with the brother. Just let them go. I was parked right in front of the um the um the sheriff's station, and I walked out, 
I got into my mode of conveyance and I pulled off and it was two or three sheriff um, SWAT cars there. They, nobody pursued me no, and everybody knew I didn't have a license. But what I did in that demonstration is I stood, I stood on my square and by just studying, you know, <laughs> at least two hours a day, I was able to articulate this information in a way where they had to back up off of me. So that's, I just wanted to make a long story short in a relatively short time. That's all. And I yield. Wow. Any, any, Thank uh, you for sharing that. Yeah. I appreciate that, man. And uh, y'all want to do something? You still free today? Maybe about like 30 minutes? Or remember when we close out this meeting? Do um yeah yes and no because I'm, I'm i'm at the um my mother once again she's having um she's rehabbing and i'm actually pulling up right now as we speak okay. i'm pulling up and I, I i actually sit in on some of her rehabbing and things like that you know as she's getting better so yeah i'm i'm gonna be i'll probably be free man in about another hour or so i could just text you yes, and then know. we can go from there okay yeah. Did Did anybody else have any thoughts on uh, the brother Larry Bay was speaking on? Oh uh, yeah, no thoughts. That's right. All right, I'm gonna read the Divine Constitution of Moorish America, and then um, close out with the prayer. That'll be it for today. <clears throat> Let's check the chat. See if somebody says something. <laughs> Oh, peace and love, peace and love. Divine Constitution of Moorish America, Act 1, the Grand Sheik and the Chairman of Moorish America are empowered to make law and enforce law with the assistance of the Prophet and the Grand Body of Moorish America. The Assistant Grand Sheik is to assist the Grand Sheik in all affairs if he lives according to love, truth, peace, freedom, and justice, and it is known before the citizens of Moorish America. All meetings are to be open and closed promptly according to the Circle 7, in love, truth, peace, freedom, and justice. Friday is our holy day of rest because on Friday, the first man was formed in flesh and on Friday, the first man departed out of flesh and ascended until his father God Allah. For that cause, Friday is the holy day for all Muslims all over the world. Love, truth, peace, freedom, and justice must be proclaimed and practiced by all citizens of Moorish America. No citizen is to put in danger or accuse falsely his brother or sister on any occasion that may harm his brother or sister because Allah is love. All citizens must preserve these holy and divine laws and all citizens must obey the laws of the government because by being a Moorish American, you are part and parcel of the government and must live the life accordingly. No organization of Moorish America is to cause any confusion or to overthrow the laws and constitution of the said government, but to obey hereby. With us, all citizens must proclaim their nationality, and we are teaching our people their nationality and their divine creed, that they may know that they are part and parcel of this said government, and know that they are not Negroes, colored folk, black people, or Ethiopians, <clears throat> because these names were given to slaves by slaveholders in 1779 and lasted until 1865 during the time of slavery. But this is a new era of time now, and all men now must proclaim their free national name to be recognized by the said government in which they live and the nation of the earth. This is the reason why Allah, the great God of the universe, ordained Noble Juali the prophet to redeem his people from their sinful ways. The Moorish Americans are the descendants of the ancient Moabites who inhabited the northwestern and southwestern shores of Africa. All citizens must promptly attend their meetings and become a part and partial, part, in this context, part and partial of all uplifting acts of Moorish America. Moorish Americans must pay their dues and keep in line with all the necessities of Moorish America. And then you are entitled to the name of faithful. Husband, you must support your wife and children. Wife, you must obey your husband and take care of your children and look after the duties of your household. Sons and daughter must obey father and mother and be industrious and become a part of the uplifting of fallen humanity. All Moorish Americans must keep their hearts and minds pure with love and their bodies clean with water. This divine covenant is from the Holy Prophet, Noble Juwali, through the guidance of his father, God Allah. 
I'm going to close out with the prayer. Allah, the father of the universe, the father of love, truth, freedom and justice. Allah is my protector, my guide, and my salvation by night and by day through his holy prophet. Nobuju Ali. Amen. Islam Moors. Uh, Peace Moors. Everybody have a beautiful week, beautiful weekend, and uh, yeah, we'll be in communication throughout the week as well. Uh, Islam. Peace, everybody.